in the um, bioinformatics community. She's the former president of Combine, which is the um, Australian Computational Biology and Bioinformatics student organization. And she's going to talk to us about um, how you become a bioinformatician. Hi everyone, uh, thanks for that introduction um, and thanks for inviting me to come and talk today. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm a, currently a PhD student in bioinformatics. Um, but Alan, uh, rather than talking about my research today, Alan asked me to come and talk about my experiences in training bioinformaticians. Um, before we get into that though, I wanted to give a little bit of background, adding to some of the things that Bernie has already told you about. Um, and that is, what is bioinformatics? So, you've seen this diagram before now, um, but as a reminder, DNA is made up of A, T, Cs, and Gs. Um, there's around three billion letters in the human genome. And when Bernie was talking about finding mutations, uh, you can conceptualize that as looking for the spelling mistake in your genome. Why is this important? Well, again, Bernie's given a great background on this. Uh, so these uh, single mutations are responsible for disease in about one in 100 people. So although each individual mutation is very rare, uh, collectively they're a huge b disease burden on our society. Knowing what, finding these mutations is really critical to doing diagnosis, for tailoring medication, um, for you know, discovering, uh, uh, new, developing new drugs that can target particular mutations. And the human genome is large. I say three billion base pairs, but just to put that in a little bit of context, a single copy of War and Peace, which is not the largest book ever written, but it's on that like, top list if you check Wikipedia, uh, that has three million letters. So in order, if you took a thousand copies of War and Peace, then you have the size of the human genome. If you were to stack those copies of War and Peace on top of each other, you would end up with a stack about as high as an 18 story building. Put another way, uh, if you were to represent the human genome, um, each base pair as a byte, it would be about three gig. And in fact, there is a copy of the human genome sitting on my laptop, and it is around 2.9 gigabytes as an uncompressed text file. And we are often loading that into memory. The first human genome took about 10 years to sequence. It cost about $3 billion. <laughs> so that's a dollar per base pair. <laughs> um, the second genome, or well, these actually sort of came out at the same time, but the second one was started a little bit later. That one cost, uh, took about four years and about 300 million. Today, we can sequence a human genome for about a thousand US dollars. And I've got this quoted as two weeks, but it's probably a bit quicker now. These uh, slides are getting out of date already because that's what happens in science. And here's the uh, required graph of the cost of sequencing, slightly different edition, different colors. Um, but the basic point here is that the cost of sequencing is going down extremely quickly, far exceeding Moore's law. Um, this is on a log scale. So our ability to analyze and store this data is, you know, it's a real struggle to keep up with the sheer volume of data that's being produced. And a lot of this is because of these new next generation sequencing technologies. Um, and the idea behind these is you chop the genome up into tiny little bits and you sequence each one. So going back to our war and peace analogy, we've got our thousand copies of war and peace and now we're gonna shred them, right? So we take all of that paper, shred it up into tiny fragments with say 100 letters on each little slip of paper and then we read them. Then we have to reconstruct the story. So we have to put it back together into you know, the sequence that it came from. And finally, we need to find the typo. Easy, right? It's a pretty hard problem. 
Um, and there's a lot of very smart people thinking long and hard about the uh, most accurate and fast way to do this. So I, we said th three billion, but that's actually a bit of an underestimate. So you've got two copies, so you're up to six billion, okay. Um, because we're only reading tiny chunks at a time and those chunks can contain errors, and then there's a whole bunch of biases around sampling from different parts of the genome. Um, so often what we have to do is we have to sequence a person about 40 times on average to get a really accurate idea of their genomic sequence. Um, so the size of the data that we're getting off this machine, of these machines is in the order of, uh, say, 100 gigabytes, depending on how much you sequence and how accurate you want to be. Uh, so this is where the training comes in, right? So imagine you're a biologist. Maybe some people in this room can, you know, think back to this experience. Um, so let's say you're a PhD student, you've studied biology, uh, and your supervisor hands you a hard drive full of human genomes. And this happens. Um, could you please analyze these, go figure out how to do that? That would be awesome, thank you. Um, and this is where bioinformatics comes in. So at this point, this PhD student is probably gonna wanna go talk to a bioinformatician who will say, why don't you come see me before you sequence them, usually. Um, and then they're going, so they're gonna need an expert or they're going to have to learn these skills themselves. And increasingly, supervisors are expecting their PhD students to go and, and learn these skills. So that's what I think of as bioinformatics. Obviously, it's a much bigger field than that, but that's the bit that um, it's, it's probably the largest and that I'm most familiar with. So we need a bioinformatician. What's a bioinformatician? Um, Inevitably, you end up with a Venn diagram. A bioinformatician is someone who sits at the intersection of statistics, computer science, and biology. There's, they tend to come from one particular area and then build up expertise in the others. They're not necessarily this perfectly balanced person that is sort of assumed in my Venn diagram. So bioinformaticians come from lots of different places. Uh, most commonly from biology, computer science, or statistics. Uh, but also quite often from other data intensive fields like physics and engineering, anywhere where there's those sort of analytic skills. Um, and the really nice thing about bioinformatics is it's actually still a relatively young field, uh, and there's still opportunities to get in while the career pathway isn't necessarily set yet. Um, there's still loads of opportunities for people to come from other fields, often later in their careers, um, and get into this still relatively young field. So bioinformaticians actually do a whole bunch of different kinds of things. You've heard about a couple of them. Um, so Bernie talked about writing pipelines, um, managing databases. Uh, some bioinformaticians write algorithms, like for example, that program that figures out where all the DNA fragments go in the genome. Um, they also might develop statistical methods or apply statistical methods and do data analysis. They do visualization. Um, we also work in a lot of different areas, uh, primarily doing research or helping other people do research. We work in academia, we work in industry, and we work with data from a huge number of fields in biological science. You've heard a lot about medical, and I'm also in that sort of medical category, um, but also a lot of basic science research, agriculture, environmental, lots and lots of fun things. Melbourne's actually a really good place to be for medical bioinformatics in particular. So uh, this is just a map of medical research institutes within a few kilometers of where I work. So I'm at the Murdoch Children's Research Institute at the top left-hand corner, but Parkfield's a really awesome place the bioinformatics community. So I promised to talk a little bit about training. So this is this kind of concept of how people become bioinformaticians. You start with this person who has domain expertise deep in one area, and then some sort of magic occurs, and out comes this amazing bioinformatician who can do all the data analysis. Um, but this little arrow in the middle is not that well defined. A lot of bioinformaticians learn on the job or you know, just kind of pick it up in their spare time. I was really lucky. Uh, so I came to bioinformatics when I was quite young. I was more than willing to go back to uni and spend another two years sort of learning the foundations of bioinformatics. 
I did a Master's of Science in Bioinformatics at the University of Melbourne. The way this course works is that they stream you based on your background. So I came from biology, so I did courses in computer science and statistics, and then I did a research project. This was awesome fun, I loved it. Um, but it's not necessarily a great pathway for everyone. So I wanted to go back and spend a couple more years at uni. Not everyone has that option or wants to. Um, and in the last few years, uh, I've become, you know, it's becoming increasingly apparent to me that I, I meet these PhD students who've studied biology and what they're crying out for is training in computational skills. Uh, and they don't want to go do a master's, they want to learn them right now and quickly. So I run this organization called Combine. Um, it's an organization for students and early career researchers, so recent PhD graduates mostly. Um, people who work in bioinformatics and computational biology. We do a lot of things, workshops, seminars, yearly conference. Um, but a lot of that time is actually spent on the workshop side of things. Because as I said, biologists are crying out for training. And thinking about it from the perspective of a biologist, you know, the people that we train come from very variable backgrounds. They often have had, their only experience of interacting with the computer has been through a graphical interface. So the command line can be a scary place when you first get started. Um, and they might have preconceptions about the difficulty of programming. They may, in fact, have avoided programming in their undergraduate studies. And these are really busy people that don't want to spend a lot of time. Um, and so these workshops need to be quick. So during our search for the ultimate computational workshop, we got involved with these two organizations, Software Carpentry and Data Carpentry. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how these work and why I think they're a really great way to do computational education. So how it works. These are two, day, two full day intensive workshops. One of the big things that we do is we emphasize live coding. And there's a couple of great things about live coding. One, it makes the instructor slow down and talk through what they're doing. Um, and it also shows that the instructors are human too. So when an instructor makes a syntax error, everything comes up with you know, red flashing lights. Uh, the students can be involved in that process of figuring out what went wrong and helping them fix it and seeing that this is a totally normal experience for programmers every day. Um, because there can be a bit of a perception from newcomers to programming that uh, it just works the first time and you know how to do things. We also run, they're, they're very hands-on. Everyone sits at their laptops for the entire workshop. They can follow along and try out the code that's being demonstrated to them. And then we have a whole series of programming exercised for them to figure out themselves. And we also encourage collaboration. So this particular picture, you can see someone live coding, showing the shell on the top there, but everyone's sort of facing forward. Actually, what we've learned is that a workshop that looks a bit more like this uh, works well. So having people in groups around tables, encouraging them to chat about where they're stuck and get help from their peers. Um, and we also encourage people to bring a friend so they have a buddy when they go back to their labs, to their research groups, um, and they can kind of continue the learning process on their own with a friend. So typically workshops have around 40 learners. We like to have minimum two instructors, um, four is my preference, because it gets pretty tiring talking straight for a couple of days. Um, so these instructors go through training process that's run by Software Carpentry. And that's, I think, also a two-day intensive workshop to learn how to be a, a carpentry instructor. We also have these people called helpers. Uh, and these are the one people who wander around and help people one-on-one. -on -one, um, and they don't have to have any special training. They're just there to make sure that everybody gets that one-on-one -on -one attention. So we generally cover between three and four topics or modules over the course of a workshop. And we also run these at very little cost, in many cases completely free for attendees. And that's because all the instructors uh, and the helpers are volunteers. 
and then we often get sponsorship to cover any costs that we over and above that. So what do we teach? The modules uh, that we kind of pick and choose from are these. So we always teach the bash shell. And what we're emphasizing there is how to automate repetitive tasks. We teach a language, typically Python or R, depending on the audience. There are modules for MATLAB, but we haven't found much demand in bioinformatics for MATLAB. And there we're emphasizing building modular testable code. So right from the beginning, teaching those concepts on your first day of learning to program. We, use, we teach Git and GitHub. And there, we're not just emphasizing you know, tracking your changes, but also opening them up to the world of social coding, collaboration, and open source licenses. So again, we teach that all in two days. Um, and in some workshops, we also teach data management. So we talk about spreadsheets. Um, and this is a controversial topic. Uh, there's a little bit of what can go wrong when you try and do bioinformatics in Excel. Um, but also, there's some cases where a spreadsheet actually is a really appropriate tool for, for looking at your data. And then we say, okay, well, what happens when a spreadsheet is no longer appropriate? How do you move to a database? Um, and how do you actually make that transition? So we literally take an Excel spreadsheet and we say, okay, how can we reformulate this so that it fits in a database? And we design the database to fit that data. And there's a whole bunch of specific modules as well on particular topics like RNA, genomics -y kinds of things. So I've mentioned these two organizations. Software Carpentry was the first one. It's been around for quite a number of years now. It's been really big in Australia for the last couple of years. Um, Data Carpentry is a little bit newer and has a slightly different emphasis. So Software Carpentry is about teaching programming. Um, so both teach the Bash shell environment. Uh, software Carpentry is much more like programming fundamentals, like loops and evals and all that kind of stuff. Uh, and it also ex explicitly teaches open source um, and has a big emphasis on testing. Data Carpentry spends a lot more time thinking about the data. So we talk about managing data, munging it, cleaning it, um, making sure that it's kept pristine. We talk about data analysis, and we also spend a lot of time looking at visualization. So they're very similar organizations. They're closely interlinked. The training for the instructors is very similar. Um, but they just have slightly different emphases, emphases. So we like to practice what we preach. Um, we tell them to do open source. So we do all our teaching open source. All of the workshops, are, well, the vast majority are written by academics and PhD students. They work done collaboratively and iteratively. So whenever I run a workshop and I find something that didn't quite work, I'll go back and submit a pull request. They're all under open source licenses. They're free to use for anyone, including people who are not involved in these organizations at all. So if you just want to give a presentation at work, free to use. And they're all in GitHub. So I mentioned, uh, did I? This is a worldwide, these are worldwide organizations. Um, there's a lot of instructors in the United States and in Europe, um, but increasingly Australia and New Zealand are becoming quite big for, um, for software carpentry and data carpentry. In fact, last week, an additional 40 instructors were trained in Australia and New Zealand. There is a lot of demand for these workshops. These are the workshops running in Australia and New Zealand Actually, I said February, but most of them are this week, right? Um, so despite what seems like a large number of instructors, everybody wants to do these workshops. So pitch, if you would like to get involved, we would really love to have you. There's lots of ways of getting involved. Um, being a helper is probably the easiest because you pretty much just show up and help people. You don't really need any training. You just kind of need to know the topic that we're teaching. Um, you can become an instructor, and I said that's a two-day uh, workshop. You can help us host, organize workshops, provide space, the internet, very important. Um, and also contributing to lessons is a really nice way to contribute back to the community. And if that hasn't sold you, there's also travel. So this is Claire Sloggard and I running a data carpentry workshop in Bangalore. Um, they flew us out, paid for us to stay in a lovely hotel, 
Um, and then at the end of the workshop, by the way, some of the best students I've ever had, so lovely, um, they took us sightseeing the day after the workshop. So it was a lot of fun, thoroughly recommended. So I've talked a lot about teaching biologists, um, but there's another side to this that perhaps many people in this audience might be coming from. Uh, how do you learn biology without going to university and studying it? So uh, I have it on good authority from Belinda, who you'll hear from later, that the Cartoon Guide for Genetics is an excellent introduction. Um, if you are looking for a course, BioInfo Summer is a yearly course, which is really great for people wanting to learn biology. Um, if you want to learn by doing, Health Hack is a really fun way of doing it. So that's a, a two-day hackathon where a researcher or you know, medical person will come with their data problem, usually, or programming problem, um, and then a, a group of computational or statistical people will hack away at that problem for a couple of days and kind of learn by doing. Another fun way to learn, which is kind of my preference, is a journal club, which you wouldn't really think is a learning experience. Um, I run, along with Andrew and Zoe, uh, a, a fortnightly journal club where someone picks a bioinformatics paper or relevant paper. We have a coffee, we chat about it, um, and we all come from diverse backgrounds, as you'd expect in a bioinformatics journal club. And if somebody doesn't know what something means, they ask, we have a chat about it, they effectively get a one-on-one -on -one or one-on-three tutorial um, every two weeks. And it's actually a really fun interactive way of learning. I also wanted to pose the question, we have our software carpentry, we have our data carpentry, do we need a biology carpentry? And I'm just gonna put that out there. Um, if anybody has opinions about this, um, come and see me at one of the breaks or email me or I, I think it's a conversation maybe we should have. Uh, and while I've got your attention, I'm gonna do a sneaky plug. Um, so Juan, Stefan and I have been working on this book, Elegant Sci-Pi. It's due to be published in just a few short months, which is terrifying because we've still got another chapter to write. <laughs> Um, and it's all about using Python to solve, you know, real-world uh, scientific problems and do it stylishly. That's very important. See the bird? Very stylish. Uh, and there's a few chapters in there on biological topics that if you've been, your know, interest has been piqued, you might want to take a look. So I'd like to finish by thanking a few people. Uh, Alan, thank you for bringing me here to speak to you all. Uh, Tracy Teal, who runs Data Carpentry, gave me uh, a lot of ideas for this talk. Um, I stole a lot of slides from Alicia Oshlak with pictures of War and Peace, um, and the MCRI Bioinformatics Group for patiently listening to me give this talk. I put all my slides online, so if you follow that tiny URL link, you can uh, go and click on everything. Um, and there's a few links there to things I've talked about, so Combine, Software, and Data Carpentry and all my contact details. If you have opinions, thoughts, I'd love to hear from you. Thank you very much. Opinions are fine too. What are the main challenges that you're finding your biologists are having when they're getting introduced to programming for the first time? Probably the hardest thing is that initial gut reaction. So the first time you put someone in front of a command line and they go, there's no buttons, there's no options, how, like I just have to come up with something off the top of my head and put it down here. I don't know where to start. Um, and usually they very quickly get it. Like it's, incredible how quickly people will pick up that skill if they're just put in that situation. Um, but yeah, that sort of instinctive, I can't do this, this is hard reaction is probably the hardest to overcome. And then the workshops are helping them get past that fear? Yeah, yeah. so um, we like to have like a nice mixed audience. Having um, at least 50% women really helps, having female instructors. Um, 
that we've got a lot of feedback that having that sort of diversity and having everybody be in the same boat really helps. Okay, thanks.